So, um, so far these video diaries have been sort of about some existential thoughts I've had about the way that society is changing and how society could continue to change as we go forward and what the role of the education system is and those are all things that I could talk about for hours. I'm such a dork and I would love to talk about those things for hours but um, I also at this point I also want to process some personal experiences that I've had. Um, for those who don't know I actually was sick with coronavirus and um I thankfully have recovered, but I didn't know if I would because I'm in the high risk population. I actually literally just found out that I have the same genetic disease as my mom. And this is the worst time ever to find out that you have a major medical illness that requires a lot of care and management because nobody's treating anything right now except coronavirus so that's yeah that's a thing um I mean I knew I had EDS which is is what she has um I didn't realize that I have the same variety of it as her which is vascular EDS it affects the heart um and the heart in turn affects the lungs and lungs are obviously very high risk with coronavirus because coronavirus also affects the lungs. We've, there have been cases of people who don't have lung issues to begin with who end up on a ventilator permanently. Um, and I've had the experience where I feel like this illness is sort of what, and the stress of it, the, the stress definitely took a toll, the emotional toll of it, I feel like also impacted my body. But this whole experience is sort of what instigated the symptoms of this genetic disease that I have. A lot of times you can be genetically prone to an illness, a hereditary disease, but it is a traumatic experience or a stressful experience that quote unquote turns on the genes and um, to have sorry, but allows you to start experiencing the symptoms. I'm no geneticist or anything, but that has been my experience that sometimes the stress of a traumatic event can put these hereditary illnesses into play and have you first start experiencing the symptoms when maybe you didn't experience the symptoms before. It could also be age. Um, I just turned 34 and I know I just I'm not old or anything, but as you get older, um, you start to experience more problems with your body and just having the tendency towards heart problems in my family. My mom's not the only one. She actually just had open heart, heart surgery in October, and I am incredibly thankful that she was able to have that surgery before all this happened. But it's been a really long recovery, and she's still not fully recovered so it's still something, a case where we have to absolutely be super, super careful that she does not get coronavirus because she's still recovering from open heart surgery and she has fluid in her lungs. She runs out of breath very easily just from like walking around the house or whatever. But as I was saying, she's not the only one that I have a very, very long history of um, heart problems. In my family, my grandfather died of heart problems. My uncle had a heart attack at age 40, I think, or like early 40s. Um, and I never sort of put two and two together before. I always thought, well, he was in the military and my grandfather was in the military and that they just led incredibly stressful lives and that caused them to have a heart attack. But yeah, I never sort of put two and two together. There, there's in a huge amount of people in my family who have heart problems. Um, so yeah, that was an incredibly terrifying experience for me, especially going to the hospital. I would recommend, honestly, at this point, especially since there's a lot more cases now of coronavirus, that do not go to the hospital unless you absolutely must go to the hospital. Like, if you think that you're going to die, of course, 
go to the hospital. They recommend basically the sign of what is in need of acute care is if you can't breathe. So if you don't want to wait until you're not breathing because then you won't make it, right? You won't make it to the hospital. So if you start to have shortness of breath, if you start to have trouble breathing, you want to get to the hospital in time before you completely stop breathing so that if need be, they can give you oxygen or a ventilator. Um, so that's sort of the sign that you should go to the ER. But I would say any other thing, anything else, like if you can at all avoid going to the ER, if you can treat it at home, it's scary as hell because you don't, you're not, I know you're not a doctor, you're not a nurse. Um, even if you are a doctor or a nurse, you can't be your own doctor or nurse. It's terrifying to have to live with illness at home that nobody knows that much about. But right now the hospitals are so crowded that they're not going to be able to help you unless you're dying or unless you need acute oxygen or a ventilator. They're not going to be able to help you. Um, for me, it was an incredibly traumatic experience to go to the hospital. And I was there all day doing various tests and I couldn't breathe. I was huffing and puffing and panting like I had just ran a marathon and I have not been moving. I've been sitting on my couch like most people have been sitting on their couches lately because we're not supposed to leave um, the house. But yeah, and I was just sitting there like huffing and puffing, panting, could, could not breathe. But like the nurses were just rushing around. There were obviously people who were worse off than me who needed help. And I was just have to wait while like being unable to breathe what felt like hours, I'm sure it wasn't, but, and, you know, this is no, I'm not complaining about the nurses, I know they're just as stressed out as I am, and they're doing the best job that they absolutely can, but the reality is that there are more people who need help than there are beds, and I spent an entire, like, 12 hours in the emergency room for like at the end of the day they didn't give me any new answers and they just sent me home and that time there I just always felt like nobody was paying attention to me and again I know that they were trying their best but just my experience of just being in this room with a tiny window in the door and you know the nurses don't even come into the room unless they absolutely need to, but very often they talk to you on a telephone outside the door because of, um, for contamination reasons. So they don't want to expose themselves to coronavirus um, and then possibly expose other patients. So like unless they physically need to do something like, you know, I had an EKG, they had to put um, stickers on my chest and things like that. But unless they need to do something physically to your body, um, they talk to you on the phone outside the door and you're like seeing them through this tiny little window and it's like, I don't know how to explain it, but it just, it just, it just kind of felt like, like the world was seeing me as the virus and like people were just like terrified of like being anywhere near me and thought I was like gross and didn't want to touch me and it's just like, you know, and being this little box and only having this tiny window to see out of. And you can't even see out into the, like the parking lot. It's like the tiny window to see out into like the main area of the emergency room where like people are running around and there's beeping and codes and yeah. And that's, you know, the only thing I could see out of for 12 hours in this like tiny box of a room. And like, I wouldn't recommend it. I, I would not say to do that. <laughs> But anyway, like, I didn't even get to what I wanted to talk about. I guess I had, like, a lot of shit to talk about, about having coronavirus. Um, I think that I'm going to be talking about that ER experience in therapy for, like, decades. But the other thing was just that I actually wanted to talk about was just my experience with my parents. And being home with my parents, I actually just sort of accidentally got stuck here. I twisted my ankle and um and injured my ankle fell down the stairs in my apartment and so I ended up home with my parents because they have a bathroom on the first floor 
and my house does not have a bathroom on the first floor. We have one bathroom and it's on the second floor and I could not climb stairs. So I ended up stuck here and then I ended up getting sick with coronavirus and then you're supposed to quarantine when you're sick. And so then I just have been staying here. And now there's like a lot of cases in Boston where I'm from. So I'm waiting until sort of that peak resides and it's a little bit safer to return to Boston and to, you know, get a couple of other things lined up before I go back. But my basically my experience here being with my parents has been sort of like a reversal of roles. Um, like I feel like because I have some friends who are like work in the sciences and, you know, I feel like I've been sort of keeping up with what's going on with coronavirus and it's just been kind of interesting being the one to like sort of yell at my parents when they tried to leave the house and to yell at my, my mom and be like, oh, you need to call your doctor and, you know, that that kind of thing. So I just, I, I feel like this experience um, that I've grown up a lot through it in some ways that are not necessarily good. Um, I've gotten a lot more cynical I feel like I've in some ways lost my faith in humanity, which is not great. I mean, I guess it's okay that it took me until 34. Some of my friends lost their faith in humanity at 25. So I guess it was going to happen eventually anyway. But I, I have a lot of darkness inside of me now. And just seeing people not care about people like me, how people like me are going to be affected people who have pre-existing conditions and continuing to go about their lives as usual and feeling like they care more about going to like going out to a bar than about whether or not someone like me lives. So that's some ways in which I feel like it's not necessarily a good thing that I've, I've, feel like I've aged about 10 years in the past two weeks. I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. Um, but I feel like in other ways it has been a good thing that I'm in a position now that I can take care of my parents. And I never, ever thought that it would come to that. Like, theoretically, we've been sort of skirting around this issue for a number of years now that... You know, my parents are getting older. They're getting towards an age where they're going to start to need care themselves. Um, they're in their 60s. But I never thought I would be capable of helping with that. Just because um, I'm disabled. But I don't know. I just feel like this experience has forced me into that role. <laughs> without any preparation, but I just sort of learned that what you got to do something, you got to do it and, and you just do it. So, you know, I feel like I have been there for my parents in the ways that they, that they've needed me through the, this experience. Um, we've all been there for each other, but and as more of an equal, we're all there for each other as equals. They're not taking care of me anymore. Um, I mean, at this point, we're like roommates, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, that's sort of just what I wanted to process about this experience. <laughs>